Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Christophe Fourgère. Welcome to this first session of the course Mastering Money. What is money? Money creation, the classical explanations, part one. What are the learning goals of this section? I want you to be left with an understanding of how money is being created in our modern economies. The two main explanations put forth by neoclassical economists, that is, economists that are mainstream economists, and the two explanations being the banks as financial intermediaries and the fractional reserve system. And then the last piece of this presentation would be to look at how that first explanation does not really jive with reality. Let's just first look at the monetary aggregates. Now, if we ask people in the streets, if we do a little survey and we ask them, you know, how do they believe that money is, uh, what is money? How is it created? First of all, they're going to say that the money uh, is constituted by the bills and the coins that are in circulation in the economy. And secondly, that money is created by the government. But actually, this is incorrect. Let's consider the monetary aggregates. If we look at what we call the monetary base or narrow money, this is what we call M0, as uh, monetary economists call that M0. This is constituted of fiat money, which are the bills and the coins in circulation. So at that level, the common wisdom is correct. However, there are other measures of money, such as M1, which is the monetary base M0, plus the individual demand deposits, which are non-interest bearing accounts at the banks uh, held by uh, consumers and uh, businesses. M2 is a bigger measure of uh, money and it encompasses M1 plus what we call term deposits, which are uh, interest bearing accounts with a maturity of less than two years. And then finally, we have an, another bigger, even bigger aggregate, which is M3, which is M2 plus pension funds, money market instruments, and debt securities with a maturity of less than two years. So there are really different measures of money, the largest possible measure being M3. If we look at the numbers from the European Central Bank, we find that M0 constitutes really a tiny portion of the monetary aggregates, uh, about 2.5 trillion uh, euros. And this represents about one third of M1. So M1 is three times bigger than M0, and M1 is constituted mostly by bank accounts that uh, individuals have uh, at their banks. Let's distinguish between the functions of a central bank and of the public treasury. Currently, in uh, most Western countries, uh, central banks have the monopoly to issue the monetary base. On the other hand, the Public treasuries, what do they do? They collect taxes and they issue debt to finance public spending. In 1921, in the United States, you have what's called the Independent Treasury Act, which is not a very famously known act, but this is an important act. It transfers the powers of creating and issuing money from the treasury to the Federal Reserve, which is the Central Bank of the United States. This is a 
worldwide phenomenon. This is the situation nowadays. The central banks have that monopoly. The Federal Reserve still is today a private institution. And we're going to see how this may raise some issues in terms of the conduct of the monetary policy and the adequation of the goals of monetary policy with the goals of the, the voters uh, that are essentially voting the government in and that are uh, expecting certain policies to be enacted. So the Fed is really a private institution that was initially founded by uh, private banks. And you can see here the list of some of those private banks that were the members and the shoulders of the Fed. So what is the role of the financial sector in money creation? And here we have two explanations that are put forth by neoclassical economists. Neoclassical meaning mainstream economists. The first explanation is that the banking sector is an intermediary. And the second is the fact that we are in what's called a fractional reserve system, which is uh, the system that uh, allows uh, money to be created and therefore banks commercial banks and private banks have a particular role to play in that system. Explanation one, banks as intermediaries. This explanation comes from a theory uh, that is uh, taught broadly in the world nowadays in uh, banking and finance courses called the loanable funds theory that comes to us uh, from economists of the early 20th century. And this theory says that banks are financial intermediaries. Commercial banks do not create money, but they allocate it. Money is only created first and foremost by the central bank. And here's how it works very intuitively. People have savings, therefore money that's deposited in the banks and the banks serve as an intermediary that means they are going to take this money that are deposited in their vaults and they are going to be lending them to borrowers and these borrowers are going to uh, make investments right there the uh the banks therefore serves as an intermediary the same way as um, um, other types of intermediaries that we're going to look at in a, in a few seconds, the other way that borrowers could raise money is to directly uh, raise that those funds um, on the markets, uh, debt and equity markets. But there's a problem with that explanation. This does not really correspond to the reality of the banking sector. However, it is true that other institutions such as mutual funds, life insurance companies and crowdfunding platforms do serve as intermediaries between lenders and borrowers. So we're going to examine why banks are not really intermediaries. The second explanation is the fractional reserve system. In that explanation, even though each commercial bank does not have the power to create money, the whole system, in the end, does create more money by lending, uh, uh, by lending more and by extending credit uh, in a uh, multiple of what the banks have as cash reserves in their vaults. So the amount lent is a multiple of cash reserves held by private banks in their central bank account. And this explanation comes to us from Nobel Prize winner uh, Paul Samuelson in 1948. This is actually closer to reality because commercial banks are actually allowed by governments to lend out money 
in an amount that corresponds to their excess cash reserves uh, in excess of the minimum reserve requirements that they would have uh, deposited with the central bank. Empirically, this looks more right because as we saw previously, M1 and M2 are largely uh, composed of deposits accounts and the monetary base, that is coins and bills, represents a really tiny fraction of that. So we're going to look in the next set of slides at an example of a commercial bank that must respect a certain required reserve ratio of 10%. And that means that they can uh, extend loans, but every time they extend loans, they have to have 10% of the value of that loan as cash reserves. Thank you for your attention and let's move on to the next slides.